Hello, my name is Dr. Leist, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about the setting in John Updike's famous short story, A and P. A and P is an easy story to enjoy. The main character, Sammy, is a very charming narrator, delighting us with his perceptive observations, his energetic interest in the subject of the three girls, his moral impetuosity, and his goofy sense of humor. The dominant emotional payoff of the narrative comes with seeing Sammy take a pointless ethical stand. The reader is left to decide whether to admire Sammy's quixotic act of unrecognized chivalry, or whether to see it, as Sammy seems to in the final sentence of the story, as the first futile act in what promises to be a long lifetime of futility and disappointment. If we want to dig deeper into the question of what to make of Sammy's act of resistance in the climax of A&P, there are many different approaches we could take to our analysis. Looking at the plot of the story, we might observe that the narrative is broken up into two sections. In the first section, Sammy is a passive spectator, whereas in the second section, Sammy becomes an active protagonist. It is not until this second half of the story, and indeed not until Sammy starts thinking about his decision to quit, that we learn Sammy's name. The disclosure of Sammy's name coincides with his achieving an independent identity. A plot-based analysis of A&P might consider other significant differences between the first half and the second half of the story's narrative. Looking at the character of Sammy, we might consider the mixture of emotions with which he describes Queenie, Plaid, and Big Tall Goony Goony. Obviously, the nicknames he bestows on the three girls are condescending and even dehumanizing. Likewise, lightly misogynistic passages from Sammy's interior monologue, do you really think it's a mind in there or just a little buzz like a bee in a glass jar, contribute to a sense that Sammy looks down on these three girls as well as on women in general. Nevertheless, it is also clear that Sammy's condescension is accompanied by affection for the girls and an admiration for their independent spirit, an admiration so intense that it inspires Sammy's own declaration of independence from his employer. A character-based reading of the story might attempt to reconcile this apparent contradiction in Sammy's attitude toward the three girls as a way of explaining what motivates him to decide to quit his job. Plot and character-based analyses provide promising inroads into the story, but given the fact that the title of Updike's story draws attention to the setting in which the narrative occurs, it may be interesting to pursue a setting-based analysis of A&P in a little more detail. What can an analysis of the setting tell us about the central riddle of the story? Why does Sammy quit his job? In addition to the fact that this story receives its title from the supermarket where it is set, the importance of the setting to the events of the narrative is explicitly remarked upon within the story itself. In the first half of the story, Sammy explains, you know, it's one thing to have a girl in a bathing suit down on the beach, where what with the glare, nobody can look at each other much anyway, and another thing in the cool of the A&P, under the fluorescent lights, against all those stacked packages, and with her feet paddling along over our checkerboard green and cream rubber tile floor. Girls in bathing suits belong on the beach, but if you take those same girls and move them into a supermarket, you have the kind of tension of out-of-placeness that generates a story. Two things that are extremely ordinary under ordinary conditions, girls in bathing suits and a supermarket, become extraordinary and provocative when crossed with one another. Throughout the first half of the story, Sammy is spellbound by the strangeness of this vision. The second half of the story is kicked off by Lengel's attempt to restore things to their proper places by explaining to the girls that this isn't the beach. Sammy's sarcastic commentary on Lengel's dumb remark does not erase the fact that Sammy shares Lengel's conventional ideas about which modes of dress are appropriate to which social spaces. While it is true that Lengel is confrontational and judgmental with the girls, while Sammy keeps his opinions to himself and responds to the girls' breach of decorum with irony and even pity, Sammy and Lengel both regard the girls' dress from the same set of social expectations. Does Sammy recognize a certain similarity between the comments he was making to himself and Lengel's attack on the girls? Watching Lengel's treatment of the girls, Sammy concludes, policy is what the kingpins want. What others want is juvenile delinquency. As Lengel's employee, Sammy discovers that he is on the side of the kingpins, wearing the uniform, doing the job, and even having the same opinions of the policy-making class, rather than on the side of the juvenile delinquents. If Sammy had kept his job and played his cards right, he could have been promoted to become the next Lengel. His job is not just a way of making money, it is a ritual of initiation into the world of adult male policymakers. Indeed, Lengel is a friend of Sammy's parents, 
The job at the A&P is a kind of conspiracy of adults intent on training Sammy to become an adult himself. His abrupt resignation is an act of resistance against this indoctrination, a determination to put himself on the side of the juvenile delinquents. And indeed, you can't really blame him, especially when you consider another aspect of the setting, the way adults are described throughout the story. In the first paragraph of the story, Sammy's dreamy thoughts of Plaid's young legs are interrupted by one of these cash register watchers, a witch about 50 with rouge on her cheekbones and no eyebrows, and I know it made her day to trip me up. Sammy's thought process brings the natural beauty of the young girls into sharp contrast with the hideous caricature of middle age embodied in the cash register watcher, who is ghoulish not so much because she is older as because she is artificially made up as a kind of parody of attractiveness, and also because, according to Sammy's perception, her life is a pathetic game of penny-pinching and opportunistic aggression. Elsewhere, the customers at the A&P are described as pigs, cows, and sheep, stupidly marching up to be slaughtered. Sammy calls them house slaves, and of course the unflattering picture of Langle provides the story's definitive representation of unflattering adulthood. In the final paragraph of the story, Sammy looks around for the girls, but they're gone, of course. There wasn't anybody but some young married screaming with her children about some candy they didn't get by the door of a powder blue Falcon station wagon. The girls had been youthful and beautiful. They had represented sex not so much as a physical act, but as an abstract idea of loveliness. This abstract idea of sex is replaced in the final paragraph with a very literal picture of the real adult truth of sex, that it results in turning a person into a married, that it produces screaming brats, that it condemns its victims to a world of name-brand station wagons and domestic drudgery. Sammy's abrupt resignation is a renunciation of the adult world in its entirety, but this last paragraph suggests that this renunciation is doomed to be short-lived. Another aspect of the setting, however, can help us put Sammy's revolt into a more specific perspective. The supermarket setting of the story suggests that the target of Sammy's satire is not just adulthood in general, but adulthood as it occurs within the consumerist society represented by the A&P. This story takes place in a landscape of packages and products. Sammy observes that the girls went up the cat and dog food, breakfast, cereal, macaroni, rice, raisins, seasonings, spreads, spaghetti, soft drinks, crackers, and cookies aisle. This surreal accumulation of random items characteristic of the supermarket environment lends an air of absurdity to all of Sammy's descriptions of the events that unfold in this story. The adult shoppers whom Sammy describes are most ridiculous in terms of the way they allow themselves to be overwhelmed by the commodities, such as the shoppers muttering, there was a third thing, began with A, the bums buying all that pineapple juice, or the married arguing with their children about candy in front of their station wagon. It's the capitalist consumerist behavior that makes these adults seem so ridiculous. Updike adds some other touches to his establishment of the story's setting, which contribute to our picture of the specific society Sammy is rebelling against. The A&P is located in the center of Sammy's town. If you stand at our front doors, you can see two banks, and the Congregational Church, and the newspaper store, and three real estate offices. The supermarket is pictured as a part of a constellation of powerful social institutions, finance, religion, journalism, real estate. Sammy's job makes him a part of the whole civic infrastructure of American power. Furthermore, Sammy's joke that in 1990, the A&P might be renamed the Great Alexandrov and Petrushki Tea Company or something, places Sammy's observations of American life within the context of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union that was at its height in 1961 when the story was first published. Sammy's joke suggests that the powerful institutions that Americans revere could easily be overthrown and replaced with a new set of institutions, and also that the new Soviet America would not be too different from the old capitalist America. The transition would mostly involve changing the names on the buildings. Sammy reimagines the great drama and peril of the standoff between the USA and the USSR as the situation of a confused shopper trying to make up her mind between two brands of dish detergent that are essentially the same. In this context, quitting his job becomes a symbolic refutation of the entire ideological mentality of mid-century global politics. The complex of power, consumerism, war, and ideology is frequently referred to as patriarchal, implying not only that it is a hierarchically organized system of control, but also that it is run by men. Indeed, 
the A&P seems to be staffed entirely by male employees, Stokesy, McMahon, Langle, and Sammy, while the shoppers are almost all middle-aged and desexualized women. The three girls flaunting their sexuality in the male-controlled marketplace represent a subversive challenge to this male-controlled environment. Female sexuality is dangerous and unpredictable. It may make men behave in ways that are not conducive to capitalist labor. It may represent an alternative way of thinking about human life that undermines the values of the marketplace. In the first paragraph, Sammy refers to one of the customers as a witch, and in the second paragraph, he remarks, if she'd been born at the right time, they would have burned her over in Salem. The Massachusetts setting of the story evokes the historical background of the Salem witch trials, an event which can be thought of as a definitive example of an attempt to violently eliminate the threat of female sexuality from society. Although in these first paragraphs of the story, Sammy is describing an adult customer as a witch, the real witches of the story are the three girls. They can be described as witches because they unsettle the masculine authority of the supermarket with the magic of their sexual openness. They are persecuted by Lengel, the Sunday school teacher, who, although he does not burn them at the stake, does publicly humiliate them and successfully expunge them from the marketplace, exerting his authority as a man, an employer, a capitalist, and a religious leader to eliminate the threat of female sexuality in accordance with the historical tradition of the founding fathers of the United States. It is clear that the three girls are symbols to Sammy. In quitting his job, he is not trying to impress them in order to get a date. They leave before Sammy makes his heroic stand. And Sammy never thinks about actually trying to hit on them or strike up a conversation. They are untouchable representations of sexuality, youth, nonconformity, sincerity, femininity, naturalness, and beauty. By paying close attention to the different aspects of the setting of Sammy's story, we can achieve a better sense of why Sammy is so moved by these ideals. Specifically, Sammy is inspired by the girls to reject the values of his social world, a world which is characterized by consumerism, patriarchy, and puritanism, and perhaps most importantly, by the blind inertia of conformity through which beautiful young people grow up into ghoulish parodies of adulthood. The final sentence of the story implies that, for all of Sammy's humor, impetuosity, and idealism, he will ultimately not be strong enough to resist the gravitational pull of his setting.